It looks like any number of other ranches you might find elsewhere in Utah. Arid scrubland, pockmarked by contrasting greenery, small clusters of forest clinging to streams and bordering open fields. But don't be fooled. Where cattle once grazed, the pastures are silent. Yet, something still lurks in the tall grass, and in the skies above, and in the ground beneath. The 512-acre property, known commonly as Skinwalker Ranch, located in the haunted Uinta Basin, may no longer serve as a ranching operation, but it remains as active as ever. Over the past three decades, Skinwalker Ranch has gained a reputation as one of, if not the most active paranormal hotspot in the entirety of the United States. In fact, hundreds, if not thousands, of eyewitness accounts have emerged from in and around the property, reported by civilians, scientists, and military personnel alike, describing things as wildly diverse as poltergeist activity, UFOs and interdimensional portals, and also malevolent invisible forces, and all manner of cryptids, including oversized direwolves and large hairy man-beasts, Behind it all may lurk a sinister, supernatural presence whose name few dare to whisper. Even brief visitors describe the dread they feel as suffocating. There is this sense that you are just not supposed to be there. And yet, in the mid-1990s, Terry and Gwen Sherman lived and worked on Skinwalker Ranch, raising cattle and enduring a variety of paranormal phenomena for two years. In fact, the activity took its toll on their emotions, their sanity, and their livelihood. There were warning signs from the start. Both Terry and Gwen detected a chill as they first stepped into the ranch house that fateful day in 1994. Noticing that the doors and windows had already been reinforced with heavy-duty deadbolts and chains, the real estate contract included several peculiar clauses, including a prohibition on digging without first notifying the previous owners. But the Shermans, looking to move away from New Mexico and excited to live amongst their fellow LDS church members, were eager to begin their new life. The price was so reasonable that the opportunity for such a perfect fit and the property being so beautiful, they went ahead anyway. They would learn to regret that decision Oddities began to pile up. Small enough at first, the sensation of being watched, items being found out of place, and the occasional sound of somebody when no one else was around. Then, things began to escalate. On at least one occasion, Gwen returned home from the grocery shopping and began unloading the contents of her bags onto the kitchen countertop, preparing to put them in cupboards. As she did so, something momentarily distracted her, and she looked away. When she looked back, all the groceries were back in their bags, too quickly and quietly to have simply just been a prank. Other times, objects would merely vanish from obvious storage spaces only to reappear in nonsensical spots, like the microwave. In an echo of this behavior, similar pranks began taking place outside the confines of the ranch house. Terry soon learned to never take his eyes off of his tools for more than an instant lest they disappear, as a pair of pliers did within seconds of being left on a fence post. On one dramatic occasion, Terry was setting up for some work on the fences and left a 70-pound post digger beside his truck. He then remembered that he needed to fetch a wrench from the house and step inside for only a few moments. Well, when he returned, the heavy tool was nowhere to be found. Sometime later, he was patrolling his property and found the missing implement 20 feet up in a tree. How or why someone or something could have accomplished this confounded the rancher. Perhaps the answer is simple. Something did not want Terry digging holes. Slowly but surely, the peculiarities of their real estate contract began making sense. Activity at the ranch would almost always increase after the Shermans started digging. Whether it was a small post hole or a larger project, the family noted how they would often hear the sounds of metal equipment and machinery, but each time they tried to pinpoint the sound, they concluded it came from the underground. Other sounds came from more obvious, though no more understandable sources. One evening, Terry and Gwen were enjoying a stroll along the property's northern ridge when they heard a loud clinging sound, 
like metal banging on metal. This time, it seemed to originate from above and not below. The couple froze, not sure what to do next. It was Gwen who, tugging on Terry's sleeve, first spotted the strange light in the distance. For a moment, their irrational fear had subsided. Someone was probably just lost and had wandered onto the ranch. Terry and Gwen began walking again, but as they neared, the light slowly lifted off the ground, moved about 50 yards furthest away and settled down again. It's that thing Tad and I saw a while back, Terry whispered, referring to an incident that he and his son had experienced earlier. He had hoped to forget about it, a large rectangular object they'd assumed to be an RV, skirting on the ground before whisking into the chilly Utah air. The rectangular object, complete with a red light, had ascended and disappeared behind the trees without a sound. Now, with his wife, the same thing or something similar had confronted Terry again. He hesitated, wondering if they should just turn around and go home. But he was a man hardened by a lifetime of living off the land. Terry was made of sterner stuff, and there was no way he would let the mystery go unsolved. He pulled his wife along, the pair trying to gain ground on the apparition, but each time, the actions would repeat. Ascend, retreat, wait. Ascend, retreat, wait, as if they were leading them somewhere. And almost reflexively, their attention was drawn away from the pursuit by another metallic clang, and they looked away, trying to figure out where the sound was coming from. When they looked back, the light was nowhere to be seen. What had it been? Well, today, we might assume the Shermans had encountered a prankster with a drone, but remember, this was the mid-90s. I mean, commercial drones were practically non-existent at this point, and military drones were only starting to come into regular use. The Shermans had encountered, for all practical purposes, a UFO. Similar sightings would continue throughout their tenure at the ranch. Terry and Gwen were unsettled. Everything happening to them was odd, but they could deal with it. As long as they felt safe, that would soon change. These inconveniences paled in comparison to the toll it taken upon the Sherman's finances. As cattle ranchers, they were heavily invested in the health of their herd, a substantial financial investment. Depending on the breed and sex, one adult cow is worth between $700 and $2,000 in 2021. Considering the average family managed herd numbers, around 40 head, you're looking at a significant monetary investment. Losing one cow is unfortunate, losing two is a tragedy. Between winter of 1994 and April 1995 alone, the Shermans lost five cows, all under the most disturbing circumstances. The first disappeared during a vicious snowstorm, and Sherman later estimated he spent a full 24 hours looking for it before finding its tracks wending through a thicket. The trackway indicated that it had broken off from the herd, unusual behavior unless a predator was about and predators are typically inactive during snowstorms. Following the prints, Sherman can tell the animal was running at full speed, and then the trail stopped abruptly. In an open clearing, nothing. It was as if someone or something had simply plucked a thousand-pound cow directly into the air. The animal was never seen again. Other losses were, for better or worse, less ambiguous. In April, Terry's son Tad was rounding up the herd in a heavy rain when he noticed a heifer stuck in a wash, bawling in fear. The poor thing couldn't gain enough traction on the muddy slope to pull itself out, so Tad made a mental note to return to rescue it, but wasn't able to circle back for another 20 minutes. When Tad arrived back at the heifer, he was horrified. The animal was lying dead. The soft tissue at its anus cored out. The incision was perfectly circular, about six inches wide, and the animal's interior had been bloodlessly removed. With silent consternation, father and son hoisted the carcass out of the water with a rope. Things were coming to a head, and the family's nerves were beyond frayed, constantly under assault by high strangeness, both indoors and out as the poltergeist phenomena inside the ranch house continued unabated. This was by no means the last mutilation the Sherman herd would endure. Only three months later, yet another body was discovered under similar conditions. Just after strange lights had appeared in the sky, this time, 
The animal's reproductive organs and ears were expertly and cleanly removed as well. Terry detected a strange substance with a chemical-like odor rapidly evaporating on the animal's hide. Several years later, another especially horrific mutilation would take place when Terry was no more than a few hundred yards away in broad daylight. He had just tagged a calf 40 minutes before this dog began snarling, bringing the carnage to his attention. The calf had been bloodlessly torn limb from limb, an ear removed with surgical precision, apparently in complete silence as its mother watched on. It wasn't just cattle who fell victim to the dark energy of Skinwalker Ranch. One late spring night, the Shermans were enjoying a languid evening on their front porch when they noticed their livestock seemed agitated. With the practice eye of an old rancher, Terry spied something in the distance, a small blue incandescent orb flitting above the tree line, just by the horses. The object then circled one of the horses' heads and the animal calmly shaking away like a bothersome fly. It was close enough to cast its otherworldly light onto the animal's hide, and without warning, the orb darted towards the homestead, abruptly stopping about 15 feet in the air, only 20 feet from the couple. The surface seemed to resemble a clear, hard material, almost glass-like, and the object was maybe three times the size of a basketball. Inside, something like a blue liquid seemed to froth and boil, and the snap of static electricity filled the air. Terry's hair stood on end, and a primal fear seized him, worse than anything he had ever experienced. And this is a man who had faced down plenty of wild animals in his day. Gwen, although equally afraid, had the presence of her mind to flick on her flashlight, which caused the orb to rapidly retreat back towards the tree line and out of sight. The couple fell to their knees, trembling in abject terror. Yet, it seemed so irrational. Why were they so afraid of what seemed relatively innocuous? Terry would later speculate that the fear had been artificially induced by whatever intelligence controlled the orb. For two hours, they sat in their living room, trying to recover until the ghastly glow reappeared through the window. The lights inside the homestead waned as if on a dimmer switch, and they cautiously peered outside as the orb danced off over a nearby ridge. A similar aerial anomalies would plague the ranch off and on over the coming months. It wasn't until later that Terry fully appreciated what power they held. It had become commonplace for a large orange object to drift listlessly over the cottonwood trees night after night, sometimes releasing smaller glowing lights. On some occasions, Terry felt he could almost perceive another sky inside the object, leading to speculation it served as some sort of otherworldly portal for these things to enter and exit through. On one night, in April of 1996, the orange object appeared, as it had so often, and while still wondrous, Terry thought little of it. It was then that an accompanying blue light in the trees flashed, and his old fear was rekindled. His three dogs, healers, began growling as the presence made its way along the edge of the pasture in the distance, and by now, it was apparent. The blue orb was back, and the dogs were barking hysterically. Without thinking it through, Terry released them, and they fled into the night at full speed, catching up with the orb. They nipped and jumped at the object, which stayed just out of reach the entire time with a playful confidence. The entire affair started drifting towards the tree line, triggering a deep dread that welled up in Terry's gut. All participants were out of sight, and Terry listened for what seemed like an eternity. Barely able to see the action until, to his horror, he heard the dogs yelping in pain. The only thing more terrifying than the ensuing silence was the fact that it stretched on, and on, and never ended. It wasn't until morning that Terry mustered the courage to investigate what had happened. After a few moments of searching the trees, he found what he was looking for. Waves of disgust washed over him as the smell of burnt flesh wafted on the dry Utah wind. Three blackened circles were all that remained of his loyal companions, each containing a blackened, greasy mess. Whatever was responsible for this violence, it seemed capable of moving with complete silence, incredible speed, 
and utter efficiency, what destructive force could possibly be responsible for such chaos? Slowly but surely, word of the siege of the Sherman Ranch slowly reached newspapers. The oddities caught the attention of journalist George Knapp, who began digging into the area's history. While the ranch's paranormal reputation flourished under the Shermans, they were not the property's original owners. For 60 years, from 1934 to 1994, Skinwalker Ranch was owned by Kenneth and Edith Myers, who publicly admitted few if any supernatural reports during this time period. However, the ranch sits within the confines of the Uinta Basin, and Knapp discovered the body of folklore surrounding this area was orders of magnitude older, suggesting that something sinister had been prowling the desert for millennia. The Uinta Basin is the most northerly section of the Colorado Plateau's province and is demarcated by the Uinta Mountains, which stretch 150 miles through Utah. It is widely regarded as a UFO hotspot with sightings stretching back to the 1970s if not earlier. As seen throughout UFO reports, flying saucer hotspots are often attended by other paranormal activity, and the basin is no different. Large, strange footprints have been discovered in the vicinity of Skinwalker Ranch, and eyewitnesses have even seen Bigfoot itself. In one incident, the Bureau of Indian Affairs police officer, Brandon Ware, was patrolling Fort Duchesne's Bottle Hollow area in the early morning when he noticed some guard dogs staring intently out the window of a tribal building. Following their gaze, he saw what he could only describe as an enormous, foul-smelling, hairy biped on an adjacent patio. Within moments, the creature realized it had been spotted and vaulted over the short wall, clattering into garbage cans and setting off a commotion amongst the neighborhood dogs. Well, several nights later, Ware and another officer spotted the beast again, this time noting its red eyes. Fort Duchesne is less than four miles from Skinwalker Ranch and is truly an eerie place by all accounts. A graveyard for African-American service members nicknamed Buffalo Soldiers by the indigenous population in the late 1800s constantly yields descriptions of ghost lights and a sense of foreboding. Nearby Bottle Hollow Reservoir, for which the neighborhood of the Bigfoot Siding is named, has long hosted legends of monstrous serpentine monsters reported in the modern era by police officers. The lake also boasts an unusual number of mysterious drownings. It's unclear when the name Skinwalker Ranch was first proposed for the Sherman property, but the moniker was cemented in place by Knapp's and Colm Kelleher's 2005 book hunt for the Skinwalker, which detailed not only the high strangeness of the ranch, but the cursed land of the Uinta Basin, more generally, of course. As to why the name was chosen, some cite the claims of late UFO researcher Junior Hicks, who told Knapp and Kelleher that, after a fragile alliance between the Ute and the Navajo people was broken, the latter tribe placed a curse on the land, tainting the land of the Uinta Basin. For the last 15 generations, the specter of the Skinwalker has stalked the lonely bluffs and thick brushland, causing all manner of paranormal manifestations. In Navajo lore, Skinwalkers are malicious practitioners of black magic, capable of disguising themselves as any living creature they wish. Simply put, there is nothing redeemable about them. So, they strongly go against everything the Navajo hold sacred that many refuse to speak about them, nor even whisper the name, lest they draw their attention. As such, much of what we see in popular culture regarding skinwalkers is a mishmash of lore from various tribes, and the concept itself remains poorly understood by outsiders. For example, some claim Bigfoot may represent a skinwalker, despite the objections from indigenous informants like Brandon Ware. What we can say for certain is that they are dangerous and actively seek to harm the living. As such, the name Skinwalker Ranch remains contentious. After all, Skinwalker is a Navajo term, but the ranch sits 400 miles north of the Navajo Nation, squarely on Utah land, a people whose history with the Navajo, as noted, is highly contentious, even violent. At the same time, the Utes apparently have figures similar to skinwalkers in their tribal lore, and the name is here to stay. As shapeshifters and malevolent tricksters, some closely associate canines, 
coyotes in particular with skinwalkers. Dogs are a staple of witchcraft in New World cultures, and with this in mind, some of the apparitions at Skinwalker Ranch start to make a little more sense. Despite his skepticism regarding the conflation of Bigfoot with Skinwalkers, Brandon Ware nonetheless believes an acquaintance spied Skinwalkers near the ranch on one occasion. If the accompanying folklore wasn't so unsettling, what they reported might be described as comical. A pair of men alongside Fort Duchesne's Road, smoking cigarettes, sporting dog heads. One of the most famous incidents the Sherman family reported involves what they can only be described as massive creatures resembling, now, extinct direwolves. When they later described the incident, the family remembered remarking at how immense the animal was. In excess of five feet tall, it had a wet, gray coat, striking blue eyes, and seemed completely nonplussed by the family to the point of appearing tame. Well, it peacefully approached the witnesses as they stood alongside one of their corrals, the cattle, slightly agitated with the exception of a lone calf, which peered through the bars for a better look. Without warning, the animal's demeanor pivoted and it bounded towards the calf, snatching its head in its jaws. The change was so abrupt that everybody stood paralyzed until Terry leapt into action, kicking the wolf in the ribs. The wolf then seemed to care. His son grabbed a baseball bat that he happened to have on hand to join in the fight, but the grip of the jaws only tightened. At last, Terry yelled for his magnum, which he unloaded at close range. The bullet impacted the wolf, but still, nothing happened. It didn't even bleed, and two shots later, the predator at last relented slowly releasing the terrified, bloodied calf. From no more than 10 feet away, the wolf simply turned and gazed at Terry with its cool, azure eyes. He fired again, and the wolf reluctantly backed off another 30 feet, but refused to leave. Furious and frightened, Terry upped the ante, asking his son to fetch his 30 odd 6 and within moments, the firearm was ready. He fired again. The wolf stumbled, but never broke its gaze. Finally, Terry unloaded one last desperate shot and a chunk of flesh dislodged from the creature. More perturbed than frightened, the wolf, ever silent, made a slow, deliberate turn for the brush and padded off. Terry left his terrified family to track the animal's prints, which still showed no sign of blood. The trail abruptly ended 60 feet from a river, as if the wolf had simply vanished. Visitors to the ranch have more to worry about than a large, strange dog. The Skinwalker Ranch is, by all accounts, a paranormal playground, drawing in all manner of supernatural forces. And that caught the attention of one of the North American's most richest and powerful businessmen. By 1996, the Shermans were obviously spent. The deaths of their dogs was the final straw. They had to sell the ranch no matter what. The hotel chain magnate, Robert Bigelow, a longtime fan of all things paranormal, swooped in to answer their prayers, offering $200,000 for the property. This purchase ushered in a new era at Skinwalker Ranch, one characterized by high scrutiny and ironclad security. To this day, the property remains largely off-limits to civilians. Bigelow spent untold amounts of money funding the National Institute for Discovery Science, known as NIDS, to study activity at the site from a scientific perspective. The efforts of NIDS, chronicled in Knapp and Kelleher's book, have been met with heavy criticism from skeptics. Of course, this in many ways is expected. Scientific validity thrives on accuracy and repeatability. Two attributes the paranormal isn't known for, and all that we have from NIDS' time at Skinwalker Ranch are stories, and they are quite confronting. On August 25, 1997, the NIDS team was monitoring nighttime activity on the ranch when something strange appeared on their night vision at around 2.30 a.m. It appeared to be, oddly enough, a patch of daylight. The naked eye revealed what looked like a dull yellow sheen on the track up ahead, which slowly began expanding one foot, two, three, then four feet wide. And that's when researchers realized they were gazing not upon a light, but a tunnel. Fear took hold as they realized something large, maybe six feet tall and 400 pounds, shaped like a human, was clambering out of the aperture. The figure stepped onto the ground and simply meandered away. 
the tunnel, quickly tightening and then shutting behind it. The only sign of the incident was a lingering stench of sulfur. By the time a half hour had passed, nothing seemed out of the ordinary anymore. Similar odors were reported on numerous other occasions, and one time, Knapp and Kelleher were investigating the ranch with researchers when they spotted peculiar depressions in the ground, perfectly round, more mechanical than animal. As they followed the trail, an overpowering stench of musk, highly localized likened to sulfur, overpowered them. They saw nothing, though this doesn't preclude the presence of something invisible. Time and time again, researchers noted unseen presences parting herds of cattle, blotting out starlight on their night vision, and simply feeling as if they are not alone in the vast, empty fields of Skinwalker Ranch. These reports were constant with the Sherman's descriptions of similar entities, which they likened to the transparent shimmer employed by the alien hunter from the infamous 1987 sci-fi action film Predator. A host of paranormal luminaries, including retired U.S. Army officer John B. Alexander and physicist Eric Davis, were brought on board as a part of the NID's efforts. Despite their presence, though, the scientists were unable to intervene in the loss of livestock, which were still kept on the ranch. Under Nid's watchful eye, cattle mutilations continued to occur, and in one startling incident, several animals appear to have been teleported. On April 2nd, 1997, hot on the heels of five other livestock disappearances, Terry and Gwen had checked on four of their most robust bulls, cemental and black angus, in a corral. These were their most highly prized possessions, and while the Shermans were relieved to find them safely contained, Terry couldn't shake an uneasy feeling as he drove away. Forty-five minutes later, he gave in to this nagging feeling and revisited the corral. Gwen shrieked in terror. The bulls had vanished without a trace. Thousands of dollars worth of animals gone in an instant. Sick to their stomachs, the couple hopped out of the truck, but the only thing left behind were hoofprints in the corral. Nauseated, Terry, almost as an afterthought, wandered over to an old, tiny white trailer nearby, which he had not used for years, weathered and rusted, tall grass choking its wheels, and he peered through the slats, only to see all four bulls crammed shoulder to shoulder and their eyes glazed over in a hypnotic daze. Terry was astonished, but could only indulge his relief for a moment. Without warning, the animals snapped out of their stupor and began clamoring to escape, pounding down the weak metal gate with little effort. The Sherman's next few hours were spent rounding up the errant animals. When researchers visited the site afterwards, they noted two things. One, the trailer seemed almost impossibly small for the bulls, it would have been practically impossible to lure them inside without their complete sedation. And two, the metal poles of the corral were highly magnetized. As part of their efforts, NIDS not only deployed researchers on the ground, but a plethora of cameras across the property. One of the most inexplicable events happened to a series of cameras mounted redundantly, so that at least one was in sight of another, covering a full 360 degrees. The wiring of each was securely fastened with PVC tubing and a generous helping of heavy-duty duct tape along the length of each 15-foot pole. The weather only further enhanced the effectiveness of the duct tape as it baked in the hot Utah sun. And to their surprise, NIDS researchers discovered on July 20th, 1998, that three of the cameras had been, for lack of a better term, vandalized. The PVC and duct tape ripped off. The wiring pulled forcefully from the housing. Twisted remnants of the PVC were retrieved, but none of the duct tape could be found. A subsequent examination of the camera's footage revealed that all three had simultaneously lost power at around 8.30 p.m. the night before. The NIDS researchers had a revelation. They had captured the whole incident on video so they quickly hurried to check the footage from one of the remaining cameras that had faced the direction of the vandalization. However, their excitement turned to confusion, then disappointment, as they watched the timestamp on the surviving footage roll past 8.30 without a single sign of anything strange. The lights on the other cameras simply went out, and while the resolution was not high enough to show the detail of their destroyed wiring, there was no way that any potential vandal could have carried out the act without being recorded. It was truly inexplicable, 
but this is but the briefest smattering of the events reported by NIDS and subsequent investigators. The stories from in and around Skinwalker Ranch are so numerous, we can spend hours recounting them all, but one question lingers. What is causing all this high strangeness at this secluded pastoral plot of land? Dozens of theories have been proposed over the years to try and explain why Skinwalker Ranch remains such a hotbed of activity, ranging from Native American black magic to interdimensional portals to extraterrestrial intervention, but many of these ideas focus on the subterranean aspect of the ranch, citing the prohibition on digging and sounds from beneath the earth. In recent years, the History Channel's The Secret of Skinwalker Ranch has yielded some tantalizing clues, including anomalous space underground and curious electrical currents which seem to run through the very soil itself. Something seems to lurk underground, calling to mind any number of creatures said to lurk beneath our feet. From the fairies or folklore to the demons of hell itself, or is there an underground base beneath the Uinta Basin? If so, who or what builds it? Above all these possibilities lurks the specter of government interference. In the intervening decades, it has become more and more apparent that the United States military is interested in whatever is happening at Skinwalker Ranch, evidenced by Knapp and Kelleher's follow-up book released last year, Skinwalkers at the Pentagon. In addition to his fortune as a hotelier, Robert Bigelow is also founder of Bigelow Aerospace, which contracted with NASA in 2012. What was his true motivation for buying Skinwalker Ranch? Well, allegations have run rampant regarding non-lethal weapons testing at the ranch, bolstered by possible waivers of liability found in some security guards' employment contracts. A preeminent UFOologist Jacques Vallée alluded to medical interference at the Bigelow, Utah ranch in his memoirs. This isn't to diminish any of the supernatural stories coming from the ranch, as paranormal accounts predate the government's involvement by not only decades, but centuries, as evidenced in indigenous belief. But it does raise a variety of questions. Were military operatives, perhaps embedded in NIDS, using the area's haunted reputation for plausible deniability to cover up the testing of non-lethal weapons technology? Technology capable of inducing irrational fear and hallucinations? Or... Do these weapons somehow harness paranormal energy found in places like the Uinta Basin? We are unlikely to ever know for certain. Skinwalker Ranch remains shrouded in relative secrecy to this day. In 2016, Robert Bigelow sold the property to real estate tycoon Brandon Fugel, who has since doubled down on security, blocking roads and adding barbed wire, guards and additional surveillance, etc. And at the same time, Another agenda seems to be at play. Adamantium Holdings, LLC, Fugel's Shell Corporation, filed a trademark shortly after his purchase. The language of the application includes providing recreation facilities, entertainment services, namely creation development, production and distribution of multimedia content, internet content, motion pictures, and television shows. This development has given rise to speculation that plans are afoot to use Skinwalker Ranch's paranormal infamy to fuel tourism to this corner of Utah. Indeed, Fugel seems to be warming up to allowing the public to visit Skinwalker Ranch evidenced by the unprecedented access granted to film productions like those of the History Channel. The property may change hands again in the near future, but whatever stalks the pastures around Skinwalker Ranch seems to care little. It has seen Bigelow come and go. It has seen the Shermans come and go. It has seen the Myers come and go. It has seen the arrival of the youths and any number of tribes whose names, if they had any, are now lost to prehistory. It will see Brandon Fugel come and go as well, and the name Skinwalker Ranch will eventually fade into obscurity. We will find new names for the phenomenon, but will likely never come closer to the truth. The only thing that will remain constant is the fate of those who dare to flirt with it. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to go ahead and smack that like button, leave a comment down below, and if you're new to the channel, don't forget to subscribe and keep your notifications turned on, so that way YouTube will alert you every time I release a great new video. As always, everyone, stay safe. I love you all, and I'll see you all in the next video.